All right, here we are. This is episode two of the Real and Raw show with John Marone. I want to talk about a little bit of the journey and the process. And I know we got a lot of new listeners here. And so if you guys don't know the the process and, and the story behind how I got to where I'm at, um, definitely, definitely stay tuned because I want you to hear some of the lessons learned in it. Now, if you listened plenty of times and you know the story, still want you to stay on this episode. And here's why. You know, I had a call with our real estate uh, mastery clients this past week. And I let them know it may be tough with what you're going through right now. It may be difficult with what you are going through, but remember you've overcame things before, right? You've overcome things before this. This is nothing probably could what you've overcome before. And I think it's good for us to constantly remind ourselves of what are those things that we overcame. And so first let's talk about where I'm at. All right, let's talk about where I'm at. So I live here in beautiful Destin, Florida. You know, we went to eight beach towns in 12 months, figure out where we wanted to live. And if you guys have never been to the Destin, Santa Rosa Beach area, it, it is the most beautiful water. It is the white, sandiest beaches you've ever seen, especially in this country. Uh, the food is good. The people are good. Events are good. I cannot have picked a better place to put down roots. We also own investor properties. We own obviously our beautiful home here. Um, we also have other investments um, where we're angel investors in other companies. Our real estate coaching clients, they've made over $30 million in commission this past year. Um, I also am an agent here in the Destin market, right? So if you guys are, are looking for an investment property, let me know. Uh, we could help you out. Uh, we have a whole team that will go ahead and take care of you. Also, we have a, a life that is literally by design, right? Doesn't always work out the exact way we, you know, we think each and every day. But for the most part, man, this this life we built is is massively by design. And so we got the successful businesses, we got the speaking engagements that you know where we speak to anywhere from a hundred to five thousand people every single session, right? We have the companies that we invested in. We have our beautiful home and our cars. We have all those things, but it wasn't always like that. It wasn't always like that. So let's kind of go back where it all started growing up in New Jersey. Um, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of stuff, right? We didn't have a lot of stuff. You know, unfortunately, um, our family made some bad decisions and, and great people, right? I have a great relationship with them, which I'll talk about the transition of all that, but they just made some bad decisions and, and, they weren't bad people or right? are not bad people, but growing up and having those bad decisions, it's like you maybe right now, you don't realize it's going to catch up to you. It's going to compound, right? And it did little by little by little. And I kind of watched it all unfold at a young age and didn't know what to take of it. And we are so impressionable when we were young and we don't even realize the belief system that is being created off of the things we see at ages four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it shows up usually at 16, 17, 18, 19, or 25, 26. And as I'm growing up and seeing this, you would think, you know, you have an opportunity to see what not to do. So don't, don't go down that path, John. Don't do it. Well, of course, being from Jersey, being Italian, uh, it, it definitely creates somebody who's a stubborn person. Um, and that is me. My wife will tell you. <laughs> but back then, it was even worse. And I ended up just not understanding how one bad decision versus one bad decision compounds. And same thing with my parents. I'm, I wasn't a bad person, but I just kept making these bad decisions. Then I became addicted to these bad decisions. And I was trying to find my way, right? I was trying to find my way, right? Mm -hmm. am, am I, am I the, the person who plays sports and hangs out with the jocks? Am I the person who's in a band and, and hangs out with – you know, the, the emo kids and, you know, the musicians, uh, it, you know, am I the person who, you know, parties and hangs out with everybody that, you know, skips schools and, and does drugs. So I try to fit into all these areas because I didn't know where it fit. Well, unfortunately by doing that, um, I lost an identity and one was created for me and it was the person who had drugs, the person who sold drugs, the person who always had parties and a person who'd be willing to, to fight anybody and everybody in a drop of a dime. Now, back then I thought it was cool, right? I thought it was cool because 
you know, people ask me, oh, can you help me fight this kid? Can you go fight this kid? And people ask, you know, hey, can we hang out? And people ask, hey, can you have a party? And I felt wanted. I felt needed. And I didn't feel that in other areas of my life. And so I accepted those labels, even though they weren't beneficial for me. It was acceptance, quote unquote. And if you're watching this on video, you'll see the air quotes. If you're not watching this on video, you can always check it out on my YouTube channel. Um, so just definitely go check that out. But, you know, so I, I sat there and I fell into these, these, this label that people gave to me, the fighter, the drug addict, the partier. And, and the thing about humans is we follow through with who we believe we are most. We follow through with who we believe we are most. And in that moment, I, I believed I was all of those things. Well, I'm sure as you could tell, if you believe you are those things that I just said, you're going to wind up down the wrong path. And that is what happened. That is exactly what happened. And wound up losing a lot of those people who I thought were my friends because they didn't need me for drugs anymore. They didn't need me for the parties anymore. They didn't need me to help fight anymore. And I put myself in more of a downward spiral, right? And that spiral kept going and going and going. Where at one point I was, you know, living in my car, right? I, I was acting way out of character. And finally the, the, the fights caught up to me. The fights caught up to me and, and I'll have this podcast for a whole nother day. But I ended up catching myself behind bars, right? I got put in jail. And this is a pretty big offense, right? It wasn't just like a, a misdemeanor. This was a felony offense. Like I, it was a felony offense that, you know, I, I was running from for many, many years and not realizing it. Cause it was one bad decision versus one bad decision. I can sit here and tell you that where that happened when I got that felony offense, that one was the one that wasn't my fault. <laughs> right. But it was like God telling me and the universe telling me, man, like, no, nah, whether it's your fault or not, you got to make a change. And so I was in jail and, and got out of jail. I was on house arrest. And as soon as I got house, off house arrest, I went right to a motel, which is where I lived prior, right? And not a hotel, a motel. And so I accumulated all these bad decisions. And you wind up in jail. You go to the motel. And you think things are going to change. And it, it, it didn't, right? It did. I think it shook me a bit, but it didn't change. And I put myself right back in that same environment. And that environment was creating bad decisions. I wasn't strong enough to be in an environment and make my own decisions. Do you ever feel like that? Where you're not strong enough to be in an environment to make your own decisions. You make decisions based on the environment. And that is not strength, right? That is not strength. And I continue to try to find my way out of it. And then I finally met somebody on MySpace, my beautiful now wife. Um, she'll tell you that, you know, I wouldn't leave her alone, but... Uh, we'll have that conversation on an actual podcast where her and I are talking about it. <laughs> um, and, and you know, the, the facts of the matter is that even though she met me in a motel, even though I was just straight out of jail, even though I had no direction, um, she believed in me. I think she had a few screws loose for, <laughs> for believing in me because uh, no one ever has in the way that she did, right, with a full belief. Um, and she gave me an opportunity to, to get better and to have a, a different environment that wasn't, you know, the, the drugs wasn't the, you know, the drinking all the time, wasn't the fighting like that was not her environment. And so when I was with her, it's a different environment, even if it was an environment of one. And so we started making some good decisions compounding, right? Um, it, it wasn't great. I mean, you know, there, there are still many mistakes along the way that were made and, you know, there was living situations that, you know, we're not the best from the motel to living without electric to living in a room with, you know, seven guys in a house. There's a lot of things that happened. And so we fast forward a little bit and I'm doing some stuff, right? I'm doing some stuff. I, I've created some people to, uh, I created some businesses to help people, uh, you know, grow. I, I, I've helped people in marketing. I've helped people in sales. Cause don't forget my first sales job was, was illegal. <laughs> I started young. Um, I started making these small strides, but it wasn't anything massive. And I met this gentleman named Pat Necarado, a great Christian man. And, and he gave me an opportunity to kind of run his sales and marketing firm. Well, that sales and marketing firm um, paid a good amount of money. And I was obsessed with making money because 
I thought, and, and I don't know if anybody feels this, that for so long, I thought money solved a lot of problems. I thought if I just make more money, I could solve all these issues I have going on, <laughs> not realizing external things cannot solve internal issues. External things cannot solve internal issues. I'm going to say it one more time so you guys could write this down. I would say have a pen and paper. External things cannot solve internal issues. External things cannot solve internal issues. Hopefully I've said enough for you guys to understand. It is massively important for you guys to understand that. Well, that's what I was trying. And I helped build that company, right? We did great. Um, but he said to me, hey man, like I'm going to show you how to make money and make more people money, but you need to live a different life. You are on a path of not where you need to be. And, and he knew, right? He was down the same path I was at a young age. And so I said, okay, let's do it. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for change. But in reality, I just said I was ready for change because I was ready for the change right? as far as I was ready to make more money. And so we went ahead and we did that. And I was, I was making, you know, small steps here and there and becoming a better person. Um, and, and obviously helping a lot of people grow in their business through the sales and marketing side, but it didn't make the big change. See, the big change really happened in October of 2012. See, my now wife and I, we lived in this little apartment. We lived in little apartments uh, basically the entire time we were together until we finally got this house. Then we rented it, but we finally got this house, right? I had my construction company going. I was helping people with the sales and marketing firm. Um, we finally got this house, you know, 900 square feet, you know, single level, but it was on the barrier islands in New Jersey. So we're, we're surrounded by water. And late October in 2012, we had Hurricane Sandy pay us a visit. Now, if you guys know anything about Hurricane Sandy, it was a super storm, right? It was something they'd never seen before. Well, we didn't have to evacuate. We didn't have to. And so I said, all right, and like, we don't have to. We're not going to evacuate. It's not mandatory. And so we stayed and we got my parents from their motel because they were a little closer to the, the, the water, um, even though we were very, very close. They were, <laughs> they were maybe a teeny bit closer. And so I remember we, we went outside. And it was just windy. That's it. It was just windy. I mean, not just windy. It was very windy uh, to where like the actual breakers were sparking everywhere and we go inside and there wasn't even rain or anything happening just yet. And we were playing a board game in my bedroom and you could see the living room from our bedroom. And I heard this weird trickle of water. And so I look and as I look to the living room, I see a little stream of water coming through. And so I proceed to get up and I get up and I walk through the water and I open up the door and to my massive disbelief, it was like roaring rapids outside. I'm talking about five feet of water. There were docks smashing into the houses. There was boats flip side, upside down. There was car alarms going off everywhere because they were getting smothered by the water and it was complete chaos. So in that moment, complete chaos, I didn't know what to do. Well, as we're kind of freaking out, the water cracked through the foundation. As it cracks through the foundation, now it's just spewing into our house. And funny story on this one, my dad, I remember he was taking a bucket and trying to take the bucket and then clean up the water, you know, scoop up the water and throw it out the window. And we did this for a couple of minutes and we realized, what are we doing? You know, it's a bucket of water we're trying to scoop out to throw into five feet of water that keeps coming in. Made zero sense, right? but we were freaking out. So we proceeded to go up into the attic, the ladder's down. And as we're sitting up there and I'm wet at this point because I was trying to put the furniture up, right? <laughs> Brand new furniture and he didn't put it up. The water started rising rung by rung by rung. And there was this thump, this thump of this tree because the winds were 150, 175 mile per hour winds was hitting the roof and it boom, boom. And the water is rising rung by rung. And I remember sitting back and looking at, at, my now wife looking at my parents, looking at our dog or cat and just thinking to myself, like I, I did this. I didn't want to evacuate. I put us in this situation. And so from that moment, I I'd said, Hey, if, if I get out of here, I'm going to make an impact. And I never really used the word that way. Um, and as well as I, I said, I need to, I'm going to change a blueprint of our family's last name and I'm, I'm going to do something different. Well, I didn't know what that different thing was. I just put it out there. And we fast forward to the next morning, the water has receded from, you know, four or five feet in our house to maybe one foot. And so I went out 
And I knew we had to get rescued because high tide was coming back. And if high tide comes back and we were still there, our house could have shifted or got off the foundation and went into, you know, the bay or whatever it might've been. And so I go outside and there's still five feet of water out there. It's freezing cold. The water is rainbow colored because of all the, the boats that flipped over and the oil. And I heard this little wah, 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 this jet ski <laughs> come riding up on our street. Um, and it was this kid who um, had gotten a jet ski. It wasn't even his. He found it basically as he was going through the water as well. And he picked me up and we found the front loader. And this front loader came. He saved us. And now we're sitting here and we have nowhere to go. And so we're in a shelter. It wasn't for too long. So we ended up going to Ashley's parents. But we go to the shelter. And the only thing I had on was my wife's uh, fuzzy snowflake pajama pants, a uh, raggedy old t-shirt, and some cleats that I had from from playing softball. And we're just kind of looking around, and everybody's you know in, in complete distress um, and, and something we've never seen before. And it was in that moment really that made the shift. It wasn't jail. It wasn't actually the hurricane. It wasn't being in the attic. It was sitting there and really looking at everybody around and saying, I said I was going to make a change, but I don't know how. And that was it. Hear me loud and clear. The moment I said, I don't know what I don't know. And I dropped my ego. That was my biggest opportunity to grow. And then from there, I just, I really made it a point to personally develop myself and, and pick the brains of the best there are in, in, in the world at whatever it might be. And whether it's picking the brains, like actually somehow getting a hold of them and speaking to them or just being crazy and YouTubing them and, you know, listening to their podcast, just like you are today, whatever it might be. And I just started implementing little by little by little fail, 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 little by little. And I failed and I failed, you know, starting other companies and I failed and through all of that, right? The failure is nothing but a process of elimination. I find ourselves today, many years later, after that moment of saying, there were so many lessons learned that I needed to go through in order to grow. And I'm gonna share several of those with you today. So what you hear today, what you see today is not a by accident situation. It's not a given to us situation. It's not a, oh, I got one, you know, one good thing happened to me and that changed everything. No, 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 no. There's some lessons that were learned in that story. And you say, hey, what are those lessons? Hey, John, what can I take from your story to not go through it right now? Lesson number one. Lesson number one. Own your shit. Own your shit to own your shift. Own your shit to own your shift. And I say this because... I think a lot of us continue to point the fingers on why we aren't where we are. The market's bad. The leads are bad. My boss is bad. My, my family's bad. All these things and all these reasons on why we aren't where we really want to be. And I'm calling your bullshit on it because I had to call my own bullshit on it. You need to own it. Now, have things happen to you in your life? Without a doubt. But it's not your fault what happened to you, right? But it's your responsibility on what you do with it. So that's number one, own your shit to own your shift. Number two is your environment is everything. Your environment is everything. And if you are in a position now where you're in a bad environment, John, how do I get out of it? It's just make a better decision on a Friday night instead of going out and having beers with those same people, stay home and listen to a John Marone podcast, right? Instead of going out and spending money on whatever you're spending money on, spend that money on investing in yourself and in your business by getting a coach, a mentor, an accountability group. Your environment is everything. Okay. Number three, number three, and I said it before, the moment you drop your ego and say, I don't know what I don't know is your biggest opportunity to grow. I had thought for so long, I knew everything and I was scared to ask because I didn't want to make it seem like I didn't know. I was embarrassed. I didn't know. And that affected my ego. So here. You don't know what you don't know. Drop the ego. And that's a massive opportunity to grow. The next lesson learned, and I promise you guys, there's many, many more, but I just want to give you a few. The next lesson learned during the process is that failure, the word failure is not an option. I, I get it. But at the same time, it scares people away from failing. And the thing about failing is it's a process of elimination. Failing is a part of the process of success. 
I'll say that again. Failing is a part of the process to success. And we fail on all different levels. I still fail to this day, but knowing, okay, that didn't work. Where can I go to next? So fail faster, right? Like, and understand that that failing is not a bad thing. Not failing means you're not taking enough action. Not failing means you're not taking enough action, plain and simple. You're not taking accelerated action because I promise you, if you take faster action, you'll find where you fall off the cliff faster. And then you'll understand, okay, where you misstep and then make that change faster. So don't be scared to fail. Say, I'm not worried about that. I'm, I'm scared that you're not willing to fail enough to get to where you want to go. Don't be scared to fail. I am worried that you're not willing to fail enough to get to where you want to go. Another lesson learned in this process that I think you could take and you could implement. And you could do that no matter where you're at in your life. Whether you're doing great or you're not doing great. It's that asking for help, like I talked about before, was something I needed to do. I need to ask for help. And so I did. I asked Pat, right? I asked all these people, even though they know I was asking them, right? I was typing it in into YouTube and seeing what their answers were. I had to figure that I had to get the answers because I didn't have them, right? And that's okay. And the last thing is your past is not your future. Your past is not your future. I, I had such a hard time wanting to create the life that I currently have because I felt like I wasn't capable, yes, but I wasn't worthy enough to create this life and everything I want more because of the mistakes I've made in my life, because of the people I've disappointed in my life. And the more that we do that, the less chance we have of succeeding. I just had a call with one of our clients. Um, so if you're coaching with us, you have a group coaching and then you have one-on-one -on -one calls that you could book. And I was actually talking about the Dallas Cowboys because I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan and he was talking about the 49ers um, and, and talking about, man, like, I wonder if I could actually get excited about next season because the last two years have been heartbreaking. And then I asked him, you know, what's going on with your life? And he had a bad last year. He just didn't show up. He didn't show up for calls, didn't show up for himself, right? I would say for about six months of it, he still did decent, <laughs> but for six months of it, he didn't show up well. And so what I told him, I'm going to tell you, and it goes back to what I just said for one of the lessons learned. If you want to have a championship season, you can't remember what happened last season. Like you could remember, but you can't hold on to it. Should I say, if you want to have a championship season, you can't hold on to the losing season. If you want to have a championship season, stop holding on to the losing season. Know what you did wrong. Know what you need to change without a doubt, but make that change and go. You want to wear that little chip on your shoulder? That is fine. But realize your losing season, it, the more that you identify as that season, the more you identify of the shame and the guilt that happened in that season, the more you're going to identify that in this season. So do yourself a favor and realize your past is not your future. See, your past is not your present. So find a way to go through that find love, understand the lesson learned and not the mistake. And that's the last piece of understanding. In the past, we've made mistakes. I know you've made mistakes, right? Like you've made probably plenty of mistakes. Maybe not as many as I have. But the more that you keep going back and remembering the mistake without the lesson learned, the more you stop yourself from growing. So do yourself a favor. Don't beat yourself up, but go back. Understand what the lessons learned were, was and learn from that lesson to not have it happen again, to have it happen less often, and go get what you want. So I hope some of these lessons really hit home for you because it's just a few of the ones that helped me navigate the situations I was in, right? The, the rough seas I was in and end up where I'm at currently. And it's still going to be those same lessons that get me to the next level, plus more, plus more. So let's recap, all right, let's recap. You don't know what you don't know and that's your biggest opportunity to grow, right? The moment you drop your ego and you say, I don't know what I don't know, that's your biggest opportunity to grow. Number two, your environment is everything. Your environment is everything. Number three, ask for help, ask for help. 
Strong people ask for help. It's the weak ones that don't. Lastly, your past does not define your future. Remember the lessons learned and don't hold on to mistakes. Thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode. I hope you found value. If you did, do me a favor, share this out. We don't know who could need to hear this, who, who could hear it and change everything and transform the trajectory of where they're trying to go. Share it out. Tag me on social media at Real John Marone. And if you haven't done so already, like, subscribe, and write a review. So I appreciate you. I love you. Remember those lessons learned. We got a lot more lessons that you are going to learn and I'm going to learn along the way. And I'll continue to share those with you. So keep crushing it and go get what's yours.